of the Wild Wind Sailing Holidays Beach Club and Resort. Once again, I have been suffering from some sort of internet connection issues, so I have had to move out of the workshop and to somewhere with an alternative source. Um, this is a this was going to be a Q&A session, but um, I haven't got very many preloaded questions. And uh, hello, Robin, glad you could make it. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, Oscar, welcome to the session. Yeah, so it's been absolutely fantastic here at Wildwind this week. We've had about 25 people sailing with us and the conditions have been nothing short of gangbusters. Hi, Brett. Hi, Christian. Yeah, it's going very well. I would say if there is anybody who happens to be in Europe right now, hi, David, such as David, um, who has got a bit of time on their hands, uh, get on the internet now, book a flight to come out tomorrow, and you could be enjoying some of this champagne. It has, I just can't um, give it enough of how good it has been this week. Absolutely fantastic. And it is pretty criminal that there are not more people out here enjoying what is going on in this bay. Sorry for everybody who can't make it uh, due to travel restrictions or perhaps you're in the States. But um, I just have to spread the word. It is important. Hi, Donovan. In Western Canada. Oh, nice one. All right. Hi, Nick. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, Chris. Now has a dark, uh, Hurricane 5.9. Great choice. Okay, there is just... A fair sized truck going past. This is what we're up against today. This session is going to be a bit shorter. Hi David, pouring with rain, not a breath of wind in the south of France, sorry to hear that. Kuro 5150, hello, and hello, Grafham. Nice. And hello, Jasmine. Stephen's designing a new writing bag system for the Hobie. Right, I think what I'm going to do, because I've only got, all right, let's just talk about the, the pre-loaded questions that I've got so far. Um, I can't, I haven't got my computer with me, so I can't see who they were from. Yasupano. Um, but um, I can remember the questions. The first question that came in pre-loaded was, why is the FX1 a single-handed boat whereas the Hobie 16 is a double-handed boat why is that why is the Hobie 16 not a designated single-hander well it all comes down to when the boat was designed the Hobie 16 was very much designed as a boat for two people most boats for two people do have a mainsail and a jib uh, double trapeze for example on there as well whereas the fx1 when it was designed was designed as a single hander for what was going to be the formula 17 class like we have the formula 18 class and the formula 16 class there was also going to be a 17 which was for different manufacturers to make boats for single-handed racing the fx1 was uh, one and the only other one that i knew of was the Inter 17 made by Nacra back at the time, which was a very similar boat. But if you um, imagine the whole shape of the Nacra Inter 18 or the Inter 20, it was like a 17 foot version of that without a jib for one person. So that's pretty much it. If, if a boat has just got a single sail, then it is more likely to be designed for one person, like the A-Class, for example, lower volume hulls, so it's not having to carry quite as much weight. 
All right, the second preloaded question that I've got this week comes from Kurosh in Dubai, and he's been studying the video uh, from Show Us Your Cat number 101, which Jeff did about the NACRA evolution. And that NACRA has got such long dagger boards. What is the benefit of such long dagger boards? Okay, what these, I think these dagger boards must be getting on for, I don't know, maybe two meters long or something, so long. Um, the main benefit of these very, very long dagger boards is upwind efficiency. Uh, by having a longer dagger board, what you're doing is you're producing more lift with less drag. A longer dagger board is gonna give you less lift with more drag. So something like a classic Hobie 18 is gonna have a lot more drag with less lift and a longer, higher aspect dagger board is going to give you more lift. The same thing happens with the rig on the boat in if you've got a taller, more high aspect rig that gives you more lift, less drag. Whereas a shorter um, dagger, uh, rig is gonna do the same as a shorter dagger board. Um, it will still be quick, but not as quick on the upwind leg. It's um, what we're trying to do is is um, they're designing boats to be as quick as possible on the upwind legs there. All right, just scrolling back. Hello, everybody who's just tuned in. Glad you could make it. I thought I was gonna be on my own for some reason because I hadn't um, done any promotion of this session today. It's been quite, it's been quite an eventful day on the water. Uh, I've had quite a few dynamic rescues which is why this is a little bit late as well as the internet problems. Um, we just had a snapped mast on a foiling laser, which I had to tow back in. So that was extremely dynamic and exciting, I could tell you. All right, just scrolling back. Scrolling back, where did we get to here? All right, Nick, thanks for the tips regarding the dolphin striker, pulled the boat out of storage last weekend gave it a tap and it rattled, need to be tightened for sure. Yes, so as we said about the Dolphin Striker, if you give it a tap and it rattles, you need to tighten that bad boy up uh, just so it doesn't rattle. If it can move around, it's too loose. Stephen scoops the water in one go. Oh, this is Stephen's new writing bag, 70 litres. Nice. Hello, James. Glad you could make it. Thanks for tuning in. It's been a while. I feel. Thibault, Anton, have you ever sailed an RS Cat 14 or 16? If yes, what do you think of it? No, I've never had the pleasure of sailing any of the RS range of catamarans. I think that they, well, I would guess that they are absolutely excellent for what they do um, in much the same way as the Dart 16 is really good for getting a wide range of people out on the water cat sailing with a very low maintenance boat, um, easy to assemble, easy to rig, relatively easy to sail, yet still very exciting, easy to maneuver. Um, so with the more modern designs of catamaran, they're gonna be a lot easier with the tacking and the jibing um, because that's what people want. They want a boat which is a bit easier. Whereas the older designs like the Hobie 16 or 14, the Prindle 15, 16, those bad boys are much more difficult to sail. So yes, there is very much a place for these RS boats. And if you're thinking of buying one, if you want something easy, low maintenance, that you could take the family out for a sail on, um, sailing with kids, I think it's a good choice. Thanks for the question. All right, scrolling back. All right, Robin. Robin, who's sailing a Hobie 16 in Florida, of course. When I'm sailing in higher winds, my upwind bow wants to pop up in a scary way. I try to move my weight forwards, but not too much for the leeward bow. Is it a sail trim issue or just too much wind? 
yeah, if, um, if the windward bow is coming really high in the air, then I would assume that the leeward bow will be coming up a bit as well. So my assumption would be that this is when you're sailing upwind, because when you're sailing upwind, all of the force of the wind is trying to lift the bows up out of the water. So you're doing exactly the right thing by getting your weight further forwards. And if, if your boat isn't, um, if your boat is extremely loose, so one hull can do this and one does this, then maybe there is the potential that by moving too far forwards, you might be able to stick the leeward bow in a little bit. But generally, most boats aren't that loose. So if your windward bow is coming up a lot, then you should move forwards and get the boat going flat again. Um, that is my only suggestion there. What else could it be? You can uh, get the boat a lot more balanced also by traveling out the main sail and the jib by traveling out both sails almost to the maximum if it is pretty windy then that's going to make the boat uh, just drive through a lot more efficiently rather than if you're having to dump a load of sheet so if you're sailing with a very loose main sheet because you're overpowered uh, the boat is going to be a lot more jumpy than if you travel out have the main sheet tighter and then the boat is going to be uh, a lot easier to control. There we go. Thanks for the question. Just got an excavator approaching, would you believe? Um, that's exciting, isn't it? All right, scrolling back. We might have to pause for a second for a noisy digger. All right, Herbert, good to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. Today is a good day to sail in North Sea, Germany. Great, glad to hear you getting out there. Kuro 5150, I've been working out on stretching the legs on our Inter 18. All right, there's just this uh, digger coming past. Do you want to see it? Of course you do, everyone loves a digger. into okay all right so kuro 5150 is getting out on the inter, inter 18 getting the hang of it clocked up 16.7 knots hope to have something more decent soon for the speed stick yeah you can always get your 16.7 on the speed stick if you'd like to um, it's a good way of recording your top speeds so then you can see what position you're going up to just send me an email if you want to get that on there oh look there's that digger there still going there you go this is very exciting times here on the wild wind beach do you have any tips so that the main sheet doesn't end up dragging through the water on the reaches yes so what is being experienced there is when playing the main sheet i would guess out on the trapeze uh, the main sheet is ending up in the water and dragging behind the boat a fair bit so it depends firstly are you playing the main sheet as the helm or is the crew playing the main sheet let's assume you're playing the main sheet as the helm then what I would generally do is get the crew to take the other end of the main sheet so the end that's coming from the traveller and then one of the crew's key jobs whilst out on the trapeze as well as pulling the downhaul on playing the jib is main sheet management so they can take um, care of the main sheet that is going in the water so they obviously need to make sure that there's always sheet available to you if you are getting a big gust and um, you need to be able to let it out but the crew should be responsible for definitely stopping the main sheet from going anywhere near to that windward rudder because if you fly the hull get the main sheet hooked around the rudder then that is 
all right, we've got to stop the boat and sort it out. I hope that helps to some degree. What I do if I haven't got the crew to help me with the main sheet is every time I pull the main sheet in, I will then just toss the extra onto the trampoline and keep it tidy as I go along. All right, scrolling back. Good to have you all on board. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you didn't see it at the start, it has been absolutely gangbusters here at Wildwind this week. I've been, there's been a lot of boating going on. Uh, I've had Bad Boy 94 out where we did 23.5 knots, which was pretty quick, although I'm told that tornadoes are quicker than that and I should uh, stop sailing with the brakes on. Isaac. All right, Isaac has got an F-18 Capricorn, which is the C-1. It uses a hook system for the mainsail, like the C-2. We often have uh, problems with getting the hook to hook in any tips. Yeah, I would go and show you on a boat, but with the internet being so temperamental, I worry that if I do move away from my current location, I'm gonna drop out of the internet here. So here's what I would suggest with, so with the boats like the Hobie 18 Classic, Tornado, a lot of F-18s, they have for locking the mainsail up on the top of the halyard, top of the sail, you have a ring and then on the top of the mast you have a hook the idea is that the hook pulls up drops on the ring pulls up drops down onto the ring and that's what locks the sail up at the top now there's a few things you can try to make it easier to lock the sail up the first one how is the halyard attached to your ring is there a little extra bit on the top or does it just not straight onto the ring? If it not straight onto the ring, then perhaps have a look at tying it on differently. Um, what you don't want to do, if, if the halyard just ties straight onto the ring, is don't tie it on using a bowline or a, a pal stake um, because it might not be able to pull the sail up high enough. Instead, you're much better off tying it using a tie a single overhand knot or a thumb knot in the end of the halyard and then basically tie the same around the ring uh, like how I've demonstrated in the past with tying the shock cord onto the trapezes that's going to make a very small low profile knot which is very uh, reliable um, which is going to make you able to pull your sail up a bit higher so it should make it a bit easier to hook in that is number one the second thing you can do is just look at I'm not sure how the C1 is rigged but some boats like the Dart 18 have the hook on one side of the mast and if your halyard isn't coming the right side of the hook before you start hoisting then it's impossible to hook the sail up so what you want to do before you hook the sail up is from behind the mast take a look up the mast like that and then if it looks like the halyard is being pushed to the side of the hook then you have to take the rope and kind of whip it to get it onto the right side of the hook before you start hoisting very important there we go okay so um and then if what else yeah, and then if you've done those things, the other things that you can do to help, if your ring does have another little ring on the top where it ties on, you want it tied on just with a stopper knot in the end, and then experiment with having either the stopper knot at the back or the stopper knot at the front. If you've done all of those things and you're still having problems, let's talk about it again. Okay. Thanks very much for the question. Uh, when I was rigging the tornado the other day, I was having those exact questions. So I really did um, explore all of the avenues to get that bad boy to lock up.
as described just there. Okay, here we go. Isaac says we've tried a lot of different knots, so that should not be a problem. Maybe we should cut a little part of the luff. I think before you do that, it would be worth, maybe you could even send me a photograph of the top of the sail, get it locked in, tip the boat on its side, and then have a look, see if you can get any clues from that. If not, send me a picture before you start cutting the sail, because that is a one-way street. Okay, we've got Jeff Le French Breton from Hong Kong. All right, is there any benefit to raise the jib higher? It hooked on a ring, I can easily raise up. Heard it's good to have a low jib, what do you think? Yes, the trend these days because of, what would you call it, science, is to have the jib as low down as possible because what that does is gives your sail plan a lower center of effort this is like um, the F-18s which have a deck sweeper mainsail or the A-class boats which have a deck sweeper mainsail. The reason that is efficient is because it's bringing the centre of effort of the rig lower down, which means the power in the rig is doing more to drive the boat forwards and less to make you fly the hull. So yes, putting the jib lower down is going to be better. One thing you do need to consider when moving um, the jib up or down is when you sheet the sail in, are you getting an even amount of tension in the foot of the sail, the bottom, and the leech of the sail, the back edge? If um, by lowering it down, you're getting loads of tension in the foot, but it's impossible to get any tension in the leech, then that means you've lowered the sail too much for your particular class of boat. But I would go as low as you can, but so your sheeting angle is still good. All right, good question. Oscar took the, oh, Oscar's taken the Eagle 20 out for a spin. Love it, have you ever sailed one? No, I have seen one, but I've never sailed one. I can imagine it is an absolute beast. Uh, the Eagle 20 has got very similar dimensions to the Tornado but I believe it's quite a bit lighter, so it is gonna go like quickly. Lorenzo, buongiorno, ciao, le come stai? Um, first sale of the season with the Wildcat, done. Great stuff. Look after those dagger boards. All right, Arno, hi Arno. Glad that you can make it. Good morning from Edmonton. How much do I tighten up the Dolphin Striker Thanks. Yeah, we um, just touched on this actually. With the Dolphin Striker, if you're talking Hobie 16, that is, which is of course the default, unless you specify a different type of boat. Uh, with the Dolphin Striker, if you give it, a, give it a tap with something, like your finger, if it rattles, it's too loose. If it kind of pings, then it's all right. But um, basically, you want it to be tight, but not overly tight. It's much worse though for it to be loose. So if there is movement in the Dolphin Striker, you definitely want to tighten it up until it doesn't move. If there isn't any tension in the Dolphin Striker, then what that means is your beam is not supported sufficiently, which could lead to cracking underneath the mast base. So if you are concerned, have a look underneath the mast base on the underside of the beam for any cracking. If there is cracking, definitely tighten the Dolphin Striker. See about having it welded. We've had some of ours welded, although some people have told me that welding aluminium is really bad, but the welds that we've had done do seem to have um, done a good job. So there we are. All right, Nick F, we have metal trapeze handles on our Hobie 18. Do you recommend upgrading to the J and H style? Good question. The J and H style of trapeze ring is basically like the standard Hobie trapeze ring, these big rings like this with kind of like a handle through the middle. I really, really like the Hobie J and H trapeze 
ring handle combination because it gives you loads to get hold of. Whereas the more kind of traditional style of trapeze ring like you'd find on most mono hulls or older style of boats or different non-hobies basically, they're just not quite as easy to grab hold of and that would be the reason to change to the J and H style if you want to have a bit more to grab hold of. But if you're quite happy with the amount that you've got to grab hold of, there's no real need to change to a J and H style of trapeze. There you go. That is what I think about that. Chris, morning Chris. Chris is there in Texas. Chris can help you with Prindle questions. If anybody's got any very specific Prindle questions. Oscar, all right, Oscar's uh, coming back to Isaac on that sail hooking in problem. All right, James has asked, when's the next tornado race? Um, that'll be the World Championships, which are due to be in September this year uh, in Thessaloniki, which is um, the second biggest city in Greece on the other side of the country. So um, very much looking forward to that. There you go. Chris says, you all can call me, get my email from Joe or Chris's own YouTube channel. If you're a Prindle sailor or any sort of catamaran sailor, you'll be able to find Chris's channel just by clicking on his name there, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then Chris has done a lot of videos, including if you're interested in replacing the rigging on your boat with Dyneema instead of wire, it's a very modern solution to the rigging on your boat. All right. I've got Zoop Zula. All right. Is there a technique to tack with the travelers out? If not, how do you center the traveler without losing too much speed? Interesting question. Okay, if you've been sailing with your traveler a long way out, like beyond the toe straps, and it's pretty windy, you are gonna find it, it's gonna be less reliable tacking with the traveler set that far out. You are gonna need to bring it in a bit before you tack. So here is what I would say your procedure wants to be. Okay, all right, we can see there's a truck approaching. We're gonna to have to pause for the truck. All right, so you're sailing along, going nicely. Before you even think about tacking, you want to make sure that you are definitely sailing properly upwind. That means you've got the jib in tight. If it is windy, maybe you've got the jib traveler out all the way, but sheeted in tight, and then you're sailing by watching the jib telltales. Then, when you're ready to tack, what you need to do is if you have had the main sheet traveler a long way out, bring it in to at least the toe straps. I'm just gonna pause here for the, sa for the noise of a truck. They're just taking rocks off the beach. We've got too many rocks apparently. Yeah, so bring the traveler into about halfway and then if by bringing the traveler in halfway you've become overpowered, what you can do is then turn your boat closer to the wind, which is actually going to reduce your tacking angle, which is gonna make your tack quicker and more likely to be successful. So that is the kind of balance. Um, if you do need to bring the traveler in more than the toe strap, that's gonna mean you just turn the boat closer to the wind, reducing your tacking angle. So don't worry too much about your boat speed going into a tack. It's definitely the mainsail position which is more important. There we go. And if when you're preparing to tack, you're only bringing the traveler in just before you initiate the tack, if you are worried about boat speed, you'll only be slowing down for a couple of seconds but while you're slowing down, you will be heading up a bit as well. 
So there you go. All right, that's a good question. Jeff, would you use some... Oh, would you use some sort of alcohol to clean the sail surface before sticking on adhesive telltales? Good question. Yes, what I would do before putting any telltale, any adhesive on the sail, like maybe you're sticking some telltales on, or perhaps um, you've got a small hole in the sail that needs to be repaired with some adhesive Dacron or Insignia material, then yes, definitely 100%, you need to clean the sail before you try sticking anything on. Perhaps you're putting some stickers on for an event or your new sponsor, then yes, uh, we generally clean the sail using acetone. Clean both sides before you start sticking as well, because if you clean one side, put your sticker on one side, then turn the sail over, clean it with acetone, you are going to then be uh, breaking down the glue that you've just stuck on through the sail. So there you go. All right, scrolling back. Okay, all right, we've got JR. Hi, legend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, was wondering what I can do to increase the grip on the tiller. Tar pitch the baseball players use. Yeah, probably. I, um, not a big baseball person personally, so I don't really know what that is. But quite a common technique to increase the grip is to take um, a thin rope, like something like a three or four mil rope, and tie it where you want the grip to start. Tie it with like a clove hitch or something, and then just keep tying um, like knots all the way along, going round and round and round and round and round and round. And then what you can do is put some electrical tape going round that to hold it all in position. That gives some pretty good grip. The other thing you could do is you could also try some golf club technology. Um, look into a golf grip. Um, if you can find one which is the right size to go over your tiller extension, then that will provide some good grip as well. Oh, here we go. Chris says tiller grip, either like Joe says, braid a handle or use some EVA foam fishing rod grips. There we go. Or here we go, David's getting in there as well. You can buy self-adhesive tape for tennis rackets that works really well. T Hill is getting in there. Bicycle handlebar wrap would probably work. Hockey stick grip, tennis racket grip. Thanks guys for coming in with a lot of suggestions there. Very nice. All right. We're steaming through today. Still raining in Texas. Hello, Mark. Great to have you on board. All right, Stephen says, you sure someone isn't building a house from free beach rocks? Yeah, they probably are. All sorts of uh, shenanigans are afoot these days. All right, Mark says, can you explain how to properly adjust diamond wires? Okay, so I'm just gonna do uh, the essentials of putting the pre-bend on your mast of your catamaran. So adjusting the bend in your mast, you've got two elements. The first element is the spreaders. Those are the bars that are about half, well, they will be half the way up the length of the diamond wires. And with the spreaders, what you can do is adjust the angle of the spreaders. Now, this angle you will adjust to your crew weight. So your normal crew weight that you sail with, if this is if you really want to get top performance out of your boat, like if you're gonna be racing, then adjusting the spreaders to your crew weight is essential. And then with the actual wires, the tension in the wires, you're gonna adjust the tension in the wires according to wind strength. So with more wind, you're gonna put more bend into the mast by sailing with tighter wires. In less wind, you can 
uh, loosen the wires off, which is going to make allow the mast to become straighter, which is going to make the sail fuller. So more bend in the mast is going to make the sail flatter, which is going to be more efficient in a high wind. Lovely. If you want some more information on diamond wire setup, then I've made a series of videos about this, which you can look at rather than going into the numbers right now. But the general tension, if you've got a loose gauge, um, the general tension you want to be looking at in the diamond wires is between about 34 and 40, depending on the wind strength. Um, if you are sailing a boat competitively that does use diamond wires, such as an F-18, it's almost an essential part of your equipment to have in your toolbox is a good quality rig tension gauge, such as a loose gauge, which is the industry standard rig tension gauge. I did make a video on unboxing a loose gauge last week, check that out. Um, yeah, so there you go. I'll, if you remind me afterwards, I will put some links to those videos or you can find them by going to the index, which you'll see in the description below. All right, very nice. Scrolling back. Scrolling back. Okay, Chris, just bought a Hurricane 5.9. Been sailing my Dart 18. Any tips on moving up? Not sailed her yet. Yeah, I would say the, the Hurricane 5.9 is an, an extremely powerful boat. Um, it, it's got the same sail area as a Tornado, but it is more than half a metre less wide, which makes it feel extremely powered up. Like, you'll be able to get double trapezing upwind in probably six knots of wind or something. So my first recommendation would be to um, start off in a light wind to build your confidence with the boat. Like any boats, the more confident that you, you are when you're sailing it, you're going to be giving it a bit more stick when you're um, sailing and you're going to be dominating the boat rather than having the boat uh, calling the shots. So build up your confidence. Uh, that is number one. Number two is make sure you've got it set up correctly. So have a look on the Class Association website for the um, settings, the rig settings, um, to make sure you have got it set up correctly first. If you're sailing a fairly lightweight team, which would be less than, let's say, 150 kilograms combined, you're going to be wanting to sail with the rig pretty tight. Like on the loose gauge, again, it is an essential, very necessary part of equipment. Not necessarily essential, but definitely handy. I did actually make a video on gauging your rig tension without a rig tension gauge. Made that one last year, well worth a look. Um, but you'll want to be looking at about 28 on the loose gauge with the rig tension um, if you're sailing a light team or a bit less if your team is heavy, like 25. So very important with those sort of boats to um, get your settings right before you start. And then the second thing, which is very important, especially if it's getting windy and you're double trapezing upwind, is really crank on the downhaul. Uh, crank it on so hard that you think you're gonna break something and then that's about the right amount. But as far as tips go, there are two very general tips to get you started. Um, other than that, you can check out any of the Tiger stuff that is on the channel. It's all a very similar technique on those sort of boats. Chris says the techniques from the Prindle 19 also very similar so do check out chris's channel for some of that all right scrolling back all right this is just a short one today i'm gonna have to wrap this up fairly soon because we have got a prize giving coming shortly 
All right. All right, E Hill asks, any ideas where I might find a replacement? Hobie 16 mast. Okay, that really depends on where you are. Um, so let us know where you are and um, what I could possibly do if you'd like is if you send me an email later on, that's totaljoyrider at icloud.com. Um, if you send me an email, I can put a short video together asking the community if anybody has got a Hobie 16 mast that they don't need uh, in your area. Okay, hi Timon, great to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. All right, Jeff says lots of rubbish and debris in the sea here. That's in Hong Kong. Um, and he's got some cosmetic damage on the front of both holes. What would you use, gel coat or epifill? I don't really know what epifill is, but usually just for small cosmetic chips and things, gel coat filler would be the go-to there. So I would start off with gel coat. Um, YouTube is an excellent source of information um, on all this kind of repair stuff. So check out some videos on uh, gel coat repairs uh, before you start and you can really save yourself a messy experience there. Okay. Right, see you, JR. Give it the beans. Jeff's got some racing going on in Hong Kong. Nice. Full beans, says James. All right, and Chris says to Chris in Texas, what is your channel name? I think if you click on Chris's um, name in the chat, maybe, or it, his channel name will be the same as the name in the chat. So there you go. Right, I think seeing as the questions are finished, we'll just take a short walk around to see how well the internet does if it does drop out. Thanks very much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure as always. Um, Thanks for coming. Uh, stay tuned, of course, for Show Us Your Cat on Sunday. It's going to be featuring a Hurricane 5.9, which is very exciting. Okay, so we're just diving into the boat park now to have a little look. Uh, remember, we are open for business and it is champagne sailing conditions every single day of the week. So if you are in Europe and you can travel down here, like Panos, he's coming. Brett, yeah, thanks, man. Good to have you on board. We're just taking a look. It's been something like 25 knots this afternoon. Absolutely cranking and uh, so good. Um, we've had 16s out, some tigers, frills and spills. And look at this. We've got a 49er here. We need somebody to come out and sail it. So um, come out and have a spin on our 49er. We've got a fleet of almost new lasers. Oh yes, we've got boats for people who aren't experienced sailing as well, like the RS, Cuba and Zest. Uh, Chris is planning a big Prindle event for 2022 in Galveston, Texas. All right, let's get that advertised so that people Oh, you can't click on people in the chat. Okay, yeah, you'll just have to... Um, yeah, I don't know what you have to do there. Yes, we've got so many fast boats here, if you like sailing fast boats. So here's an idea. If you are in Europe, you're not doing anything next week, take a look on the internet now and look for a flight to Preveza, that is PVK. Uh, book a flight to Preveza and then get on the phone and um, you could be sailing here tomorrow afternoon. Yes, you could. Just book it now. You could be sailing with Ricky Nielsen I'm right here. tomorrow afternoon. Come on down. He's got a bag of crisps. I've got the prize. He's there, got the uh, race results. The race results, yeah. Fair. How's the sailing been Thousands. this afternoon, Rick? Oh, really nice. Best, best wind of the week. It's constant, strong gusts. 25 to 20 to 25 it's been beautiful i went out the tiger and then the 16 
and then back out on the 16. So I'm gonna I'm gonna need a bit of stretching tonight, I think, because yeah, I'm well well ironed, well ironed. It's been great, fantastic. Nice one, Rick. Guys. Okay, so this is the boat park just here, and if we turn round, this is the accommodation that we use just here. So out of your window, what a view of a flock of catamarans. We've got Marcia from the Nederlands who's just started working here. How's it going so far? Good, good, a lot of fun. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't ready for that. Okay. So there we go. Hi, Jacobo. Great to have you on board. James says, are you watching the sale GP? No, unfortunately, I haven't caught any of it, which I know is criminal. I've just been so busy doing all this stuff and this stuff down here. All right, Timon says, I recently sailed a catamaran that was self-made except for the sails. Would you like to introduce the cat to show us your cat? Absolutely. Oh yes, we need to see that. Yeah, as many pictures as possible, please. Yeah, no, nah, pesty pesta. Hopefully the Americans will be able to come by next summer. Oh yes, we could even do a Joyrider TV week out here. Probably best time I'd say would be sometime in June because that is before it gets really busy but it's when it's generally less expensive to travel uh, the wind is as good as this it's probably yeah still 22 knots out there absolute champagne conditions so get on the phone if you're in Europe and um, yeah book a flight today and uh, you could be here this time tomorrow, full power. Or um, we've got some full power excavator job going on. All right, so thanks for tuning in. I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.